I know we've had some new folks join the class since three and a half years ago when we began this uh, survey through the Bible, but we've been studying through the 17 time periods of our Bibles together. Um, and uh, you'll have to excuse the technical difficulties. Sean will be clicking for me today. Uh, oh, is it working? Good, that's much better. So we are now on time period 16 out of 17, that being the early church. The kids all the way down to the, the you know, first graders and kindergartners have been memorizing these 17 time periods for the purpose of putting all of our Bible knowledge into sequential buckets, right? It's very helpful to have a framework so that then as we dive into specific studies, we know where to put that information in our, in our minds. So we'll dive into the book of Acts this quarter and make a few more introductory comments here in just a moment. All right, so as I said, the early church, we're studying the book of Acts. We have one quarter to study the book of Acts, so 28 chapters. We're not going to be doing a chapter a week. We have the luxury this week of just one chapter, but there's going to be a few weeks where we've got two and one week toward the end where we've got like eight chapters when Paul's on his journey to Rome. So it's an overview, right? The purpose of this class is an overview. Um, but hopefully with the questions, we'll be diving into some, uh, some specific content where we can think critically about some of these things. One of the benefits of studying the book of Acts, it's such an important book for every Christian to, to know well and, and master because there's so much in this book that gives us the authority for the things that we do uh, day in and day out as Christians as a part of the Lord's church. So we'll try to glean some of those things uh, in, in our studies while also having our primary focus being understanding the narrative. The Waldron books, if you don't have one yet, um, there are, there's one more. Um, so if that disappears, we'll make sure that we get a few more. Uh, this Go Tell the Good News. So we're into this second to last volume of a nine volume set. And our goal was for everybody to, at the end of this study, have their nine volume set at home as their personal library, because this is such valuable information. So each lesson, um, as you can see on the handout, has the chapters in the Bible we're going to read, and then the pages in Waldron that you can also study for additional um, commentary. And it's very helpful. And Bob Waldron's emphasis in, this, in all of his books is that we understand the narrative of the Bible. Because for whatever reason, and in his opinion, we, churches have gotten away from that. Maybe th There's nothing wrong with a good uh, topical study, but if we spend too much time in topical studies and get away from the narrative of the text, then we will end up with a weaker faith, right? Because faith comes by hearing the word of God. And so that's the, that's the focus, is understanding the story of the Bible. These stories are, are not just cleverly devised tales. They're historical truth. And they build our faith in what uh, has happened. So as I mentioned, the... Uh, the last three time periods we studied last quarter, the life of Christ, right? We had four Gospels to mash together, and uh, Jeff led us through that. So this quarter will be on period 16, the early church. And then next quarter, we'll be all drinking from a fire hose, studying letters to Christians, which is the entire rest of our New Testament in 13 weeks. Just a teaser, one week will be Hebrews and Revelation combined. So that's going to be a tough week. There's going to be other tough weeks like that. So remember, it's an overview. If you'd like to study those books in more detail, we'll have to fit those into the future schedule. So yeah, this we're, we're blessed with just one book this quarter. Uh, so we're studying the book of Acts. When we study the book of Acts, we're abbreviating the title. What's the title of the book? The Acts of the Apostles. Yeah, Dad, I think you were defining the term a little better. So it's not just, when we say Acts, what do we mean? Actions, activities. So the Acts of the Apostles, that's the full title, right? Uh, so this is these are the things that the Apostles did. And so when we talk about having approved apostolic authority, you can see why we might come to this book. 
Now, when we say these are the acts of the apostles, is that, uh, is that a little short-sighted? Is that not, a little incomplete? Yeah, some would suggest that, hey, a better title might be some of the acts of some of the apostles, right? There were 12 plus Paul, and they went everywhere preaching the word. It's kind of like the statement that John made at the end of uh, his gospel. Many other things could be written about what Jesus did, right? Well, many other things could be written about what the apostles did. And so we, we, we have these preserved for us you know, by the Holy Spirit's wisdom to give us the authority for the church. So let's keep that in mind. We'll go through quite a few. Um, I think we'll, we'll look at maps quite a bit. Uh, the, as, as we know, the, uh, the maps that we tend to look at are of this Mediterranean region as we're studying the book of Acts because of whose, whose journeys? Because of Paul's, right? This is the direction that Paul went. He was from this region, from Tarsus, and he uh, preaches the gospel, uh, uh, as history tells us, all the way out to Spain, right? Tarshish, as it was called at that time. And so for those who visited Spain, you're going to find uh, uh, plenty of places that refer to St. Paul, right, where they say that he had, had come. And we see in our, in our New Testaments that he says he wants to go to Spain. And so it fits pretty well that he, if he survived his imprisonment before he was executed, makes it to where he wanted to go. So all the way to the, to the western edge of Europe. But other apostles were going other directions. They, I believe it's Andrew, they say, was uh, preaching in India. Uh, we know at least some were headed down into Africa. So this, this spot, this, this little point where most of our Bible events take place, this small patch of land uh, called Israel, is this focal point for three continents, right? What, a, what, a, what an intelligent decision to have the gospel start at this intersection of three continents of the earth. Right, so that the gospel could easily sound forth in all directions. So we, we zoom in on that, that small patch of land and have this, this Bible map. We'll zoom in when we need to in the future um, and look at um, Bible events. And it all starts in this tiny place of Jerusalem. We want to notice, and we'll talk about verse 8 uh, as we get into the text a little bit more, but we have a very handy, whether whether Luke and the, and the Holy Spirit intended it or not, verse 8 is going to provide a very good structure for the book of Acts as we study it. I love an outline because it helps me organize the information so that I can remember it. Uh, and we have it right there in Acts 1 and verse 8. Um, Gil, would you read that for me? All right, so this is a statement of Jesus explaining how the gospel is going to spread. Notice how he expands it geographically. It says, you're going to be my witnesses where? In Jerusalem first, and then in Judea and Samaria. Those are basically the regions surrounding it. We've been studying all the way through the Bible, and those were previously called uh, what two places? Israel and Judah, is essentially, right? Israel went a little farther north, but Judea is the southern uh, two tribes. Uh, and, and, I'm sorry, Judea is previously called Judah. And then Samaria is that northern chunk of, of land that's just above Jerusalem. So the gospel is going to spread to those two regions. And then as the final phase, it's going to go to the remotest parts of the earth. It's going to go everywhere. We're going to see those phases in the book of Acts. Uh, so as you think about how you break down the book, there's a few different ways to do it. Uh, the, the gospel is going to be in Jerusalem only for the first seven chapters. So Acts chapters 1 through 7 is that in Jerusalem phase. Uh, what's going to cause it to scatter? Does anybody remember? Persecution, right? The very specific event is the stoning of Stephen. After Stephen is stoned, that's chapter 7. you got some alliteration there, Stephen Stone 7. That's how I remember it. Uh, then it, the gospel is going to spread. And then you're going to see 
roughly, not, not uh, you know, it's not a perfect fit, but Acts 8 through 12, you have the gospel spreading into regions of Judea and Samaria because they were scattered out of Jerusalem. And so you have the, the stories of the Ethiopian eunuch on the way down uh, back home down in Gaza, right? That's in Judea, right? The surrounding regions. You have the, the Samaritans and the story of Stephen, or, or sorry, the story of Simon the sorcerer, right? Up in Samaria. And then you have the conversion of Saul, goes up to Damascus, right? So it's, it's branching out. And then we'll say chapter 13 is the, the remotest part of the earth, right? Because right? that's when you get the stories of Paul's journey. The latter half of the book is when Paul's spreading the gospel well beyond uh, the regions of Judea and Samaria. So the other way that the book is, is sometimes broken down is the work of these two apostles. You might say the first 12 verses are the ministry of Peter and the latter half being the ministry of Paul. So it, it breaks down logically in that way. Not that you don't get some mention of Paul under the name of Saul before that, but um, the book, I think, organizes itself very well. So we will um, we'll refer back to that as we study. It's helpful, I think, to have a framework. So let's look at question one. Uh, this, I think, will help us continue our introduction briefly. Um, We'd like to read our first three verses. John, can I call on you to do that? The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his sufferings by many <coughs> infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Okay, thank you. So I, we've already mentioned the author of the book, but if you were the one having to write the commentary, what, what evidence would you offer that Luke is the author of this book? Norm? Uh, the author is writing to a, uh, a single individual, same name, uh, in both books, and, and he refers back to the other one as I, the first account I composed to you, Theophilus, and so uh, and so he's linking directly in the very first verse the two accounts that he wrote. Right. right, so if you look back at Luke chapter 1, you'll see the same person being addressed, Theophilus, and there's all kinds of theories about who this man might have been, but Luke is writing these gospels to him. Uh, May, may even be a, a figurative name, right? The word Theophilus just meaning uh, a man who loves God, right? But more than likely uh, an actual person um, that he's writing this account to. So in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, <clears throat> inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Back in Acts, how, how does he describe it? He says he wrote this first account uh, from what to what? Or the first account about what? Well, you may be getting ahead of us. You're thinking of the requirements of the apostles. Um, but right there in verses 1 and 2 in Acts, what does he say? It's, it's all that Jesus began to do and teach until when? Until the day he was taken up to heaven. And so we do see that small overlap. Luke ends his first book with the story of the ascension. And then now he's beginning his second book with the same story. And he's going to give even more detail about that day. And so you see some overlap there. That's, so, so this is essentially could also be called Luke 2 or 2 Luke, right? Like we often have uh, two, two letters or two books by the same author. So what do we know about Luke? What's unique about Luke? What was that? He was a physician. That's right. So uh, were, the rest, were, were the apostles uh, all educated men? No. 
Uh, and so he would have been more educated than many of them, the fishermen, right? Maybe not more educated than the tax collectors like Matthew, but uh, an educated man. Uh, now, physician is not necessarily like we think of it today, where it's like, oh, uh, a doctor, he's going to be well, well to do, well off. Luke very well could have been a slave uh, as a physician. People would have a servant, a rich person would have a servant who was a physician to care for them. And so that's one thing that, that commentators have noted, uh, that he may have been a, a slave who had been set free. <clears throat> what else? What else is unique about Luke? He was not an apostle, okay? And you notice that. Was, was Luke claiming to be an eyewitness of Jesus? Back in our, our, those first four verses of Luke, what did he say? He investigated it from those who were eyewitnesses, right? And so who, who did he have direct access to that we'll see through this book? Paul. So Luke is, is an assistant to Paul. All the way through the letters, we'll see even at the very last, 2 Timothy, he says, only Luke is with me. And so Luke is right there with uh, Paul, an apostle, and an eyewitness, right? What, what was Paul definitely an eyewitness to? Yeah, he saw the resurrected Christ in heaven on the road uh, and was also instructed directly by God. And so, yeah, Luke uh, is not an eyewitness, not an, eye, not an apostle, but what was he? Setting him even further apart. Yeah, he was a Gentile. It's the only Gentile author of, of the New Testament that we know of. Uh, and so... That's, that's unique that we have uh, a Gentile author. Um, but it has been noted that because of his high degree of education, these, these books are written uh, at, a, at a unique level, right? They are placed very highly in terms of literature and accuracy because of the way he's painstakingly uh, meticulous about getting the information correct. <clears throat> One specific point that we'll talk about if we get time is uh, this death of Judas. It's a physician's account of the death of Judas. So much different than the other account in the book of Matthew about what happened to his body. So, anything else uh, that you had for Luke, Norm? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, and he he's not... Uh, He's not bashful about um, stating specifics. He's not afraid to put down very falsifiable information about who was the governor, who was the, you know, the, 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 what region were they in, what city were, was it in, how did they travel, as we'll see, in the shipwreck. All those details have been checked out and are just very precise. And so uh, we know that, that that builds our faith that these things are true. They are historically accurate. They're not full of errors. And we also know that the mind of God is behind that as he inspired these men. Uh, inspired, not, not because he was an apostle, but how, how might he be inspired? Should, should we worry that he's not inspired since he was not an apostle? No? Right. Right, but there's no reason to think that he also had not, right? That's kind of where I was going. So I agree, he's done good research, but as one who travels with an apostle, he's one who, who Paul could have laid his hands upon and speaks and writes as an inspired source, right? But yeah, others can certainly check who were inspired. All right, so question two. Oh, I forgot to put that up there. Uh, question two. What were some of the many convincing proofs? Uh, if you have the New King James or the, the older King James, uh, in verse three it says, 
To these he presented himself alive after his suffering by many uh, infallible proofs in the, in the King James Version, appeared, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. <coughs> what, was the, what were these many convincing proofs or infallible proofs of? He was proving what? that he'd been resurrected, that he was alive, right? In, in the Greek, uh, the, or, the word order is, is, right after the word proofs, is uh, that he was alive, right? And so I think my New American Standard puts the word alive earlier in the sentence, and it's less impactful. To these, he presented himself alive by many convincing proofs, right? So uh, what were some of those? How did he do that? Death? Yeah. He put his fingers into the nail prints and into the side of the Lord. Uh, was Thomas the only one? No, he did it on other grounds. Yeah, the first time. that was you know, It wasn't just doubting Thomas who uh, said, well, show me, show me the nail prints. You know, it was Jesus came and offered that first. To, to, but only the 11 were gathered, showing them his side, showing them the scars, because he wanted them to know he was the same one who had been crucified. And so then Thomas hears about this. So it's a week later. He's been hearing these stories, and now he's like, I want to see too. Yeah? He ate. Why is that convincing? He has a body. That's right, yeah. Norm? How, how many days does it say? Over a period of 40 days. Now, that doesn't mean he was necessarily with them for that entire span. We know he hopped in and out of different rooms at different times. Uh, but that's a long time. Does that number uh, seem significant at all? <laughs> yeah, he was tempted. The beginning of his ministry was this 40-day period of Temptation, it's a number that God likes. He uses that number a lot, right? Even referring back to the days of Moses and some in the days of Elijah, and then here you see it again in, in Christ. Uh, so interesting bookends to his work, right, with these 40-day periods. Now it's 40 days of proof that I'm alive. And so that, that was, his, that was his, uh, his goal, was to let people know, know he truly is alive because he's going to go back to the Father. Any other uh, of your favorite appearances or proofs? Oh, breakfast, oh, breakfast on the beach. Okay, sorry, Shirley. Yes? Yes, we'll get to that here in just a minute. So he wasn't just proving that he was alive. He had some, some more instruction to give. I, I just imagine that the tonal shift of his conversations with the the apostles must have been significant, right? Just to know that, you know, how how depressed and grieved they were going up to the cross, worrying about this tragic event that he's predicting, and now having overcome the grave, it's just nothing but optimism. You know, what's next? What are we doing now? Because obviously death isn't a problem for you, and we don't have to be concerned about that anymore. The same attitude that we should have as Christians, by the way having overcome death. Uh, anything else on question two? We better move on. Uh, so let's look at verses three through eight. Uh, let's see. Bill, would you lead, read those for me? And I did overlap verse three deliberately. Thank you. 
Okay. So Shirley already um, answered the qu first question. What was what were they discussing? The coming of the kingdom, which is the church, right, as we'll see. Uh, these two verses tie those two ideas together. They're discussing the coming of the kingdom. So what was their misunderstanding about that, that they're still demonstrating? Yeah, that there'd be an earthly kingdom. They said, Lord, is it at this time that you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? So we're still expecting uh, something physical, right, that he's going to sit on David's throne, that they're going to now have positions of power in a great kingdom like David's time. Uh, do people still have that error today? Yeah, they still think we've got to preserve Israel because we're going to help God fulfill his promises because they don't see that no God already fulfilled those promises. We'll actually see next week. Actually, I'll be out uh, of town. Jesse's going to be teaching for me, but we'll see in that first uh, gospel sermon, how the throne of David is occupied, right, by Jesus, who was raised from the dead in heaven. Uh, so, yeah, well, you, you see that misunderstanding about the kingdom, but uh, you, you notice back in verse 3, that was what he was spending time talking with them about, right? Because that's what's about to come. It's a uh, uh, it's it's a it's a prophesied event. It's the fulfillment of so much prophecy, as we'll see here in just a, a later question, that's about to come, and they don't understand it. Did he answer their question, or how did he answer his, their question, <laughs> Norm P? That's right. That's right. We'll just wait. Uh, it's all going to become clearer, right? He's, you know, he had told them back the night that he was uh, crucified, before he was crucified, that uh, there's many other things I need to tell you, but you cannot bear them now, right? And so he was going to send the helper. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. So that's our next question. He promises Holy Spirit baptism in verse 5. Bill read verse 5 for us. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I, I don't. This may be the first time I've noticed that he, uh, he describes it. He goes back to John and th shows this parallel right here, the same way that it was done in the Gospels. Uh, and maybe because it's, it's so commonly stated in the Gospels, all four Gospels contain a, a, a verse similar to this one, where John says, I baptize with water, but there's one who is coming who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. All four Gospels. And I think when we read that, we tend to think in those contexts that he's talking about something that's coming for all of us. We're not baptized in John's baptism, so what did Je what's Jesus do? Uh, and it says he's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. I could see that being an easy thing to misunderstand that, well, that must apply to all of us. So how? And start to think, well, how, how am I baptized by the Holy Spirit? Because I'm, under, I'm in Christ. This verse helps me uh, understand it, because Jesus is now clarifying that prophecy, right? Because what does he say? John baptized with water, but what? First of all, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and when? Not many days from now. So who's the you? Who's he talking to? At this point, it's just the 11, right? Not even 12. Uh, and we see that from the context. Go back to verse 2, where it says he'd given orders to the apostles. And here it's telling something about those orders. What else did he order them to do? Stay in Jerusalem, right? That was something that they needed to do. So they do. They do it faithfully, as we see in this chapter. So the... The Holy Spirit baptism is, is equivalent to the events of Acts chapter 2. Does everybody get uh, this type of event? Just in the book of Acts. Let's not talk about us for a moment. Does everybody who becomes a Christian experience this? Just twice. We're going to see twice. And it happens to Cornelius, and it, it shocks them, and they even will refer back to this and say, 
it happened to them just like it happened to us at the beginning. Therefore, Gentiles must be okay to enter the kingdom. So you see a very unique situation. Yes, John baptized with water, and Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, although you know, Jesus isn't even there. He's back in heaven sending the Holy Ghost when this happens, and so uh, it comes upon those who he wants to send it upon. It's a unique event, um, and then the regular Christians like us, those who are not apostles, receive water baptism, but it's not John's baptism. I thought that that was helpful for me to connect this verse 5 back to those, those prophecies. Uh, so how is this event further described? So we looked at one, uh, chapter 1 and verse 8. The Holy Spirit baptism, how is it described in verse 8? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, okay? So it's, it's power. It's not just uh, maybe a conversion, right? Like some might think of uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit might be a conversion from the old man of sin to the new man who's walking in newness of life. No, nope, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about receiving power. How was it described back in Luke 24? Let's, let's read that briefly together. Luke 24, 46 through 49. Uh, this is the same occasion, and Jesus here, Luke, same author, recording slightly different information, and he says, verse 46, uh, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You see a similar path from Jerusalem to all the nations. And he says, verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. Did he say anything about witnesses in Acts 1, verse 8? You shall be my witnesses. And then verse 49, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. You are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So a very specific description there. This Holy Spirit Holy Spirit baptism is the idea of being clothed with power from on high. So anyone who claims today to, to have been baptized uh, with Holy Spirit baptism needs to have these same kinds of descriptions, right? Are you clothed with power from on high? Does the power uh, demonstrate itself the way it did on the day of Pentecost, as we'll see next week? So that helps us, I think, understand what he's referring to. So no, I've not been baptized with Holy Spirit baptism. That wasn't promised to me directly, and it uh, certainly hasn't, uh, I haven't been filled with power in this way like the apostles are. This is all for a very specific purpose. He is building his church, using the Holy Spirit to do so. Any uh, comments or questions on number four? Question five, read the prophecies of the coming kingdom in Isaiah 2 and Micah 4. What fulfillment is seen in Jesus' promise in Acts 1.8? Let's just look at one of those together. Uh, go to Isaiah, because they're almost verbatim, actually. Both prophets given the exact same piece of information to prophesy. It makes sense coming from the single mind of God that different prophets might convey it. Jesse, would you read those uh, two verses in Isaiah? Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Okay, so this is a prophecy about the coming kingdom, right? It, it doesn't use the word kingdom in this text. You get a lot of analogies in the scriptures, and so you, you marry them up in different places. This idea of the mountain of the house of the Lord, what other prophecy uh, does that remind you of? About the kingdom where it was called a mountain. Daniel 2, right? So Daniel is talking there specifically about, in the days of these kings, the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established and the kingdom will never end, right? So it's called a mountain. 
It starts as a, a stone that was cut without hands out of a mountain, and then it crushes that tower of kingdoms and grows into a mountain that fills the earth, right? Daniel 2, verse 44. So here it's called the mountain of the house of the Lord would be established as the chief of mountains, right? The biggest mountain raised above the hills. And what in this text connects it to our, our text in Acts 1.8? From Jerusalem, right? Why would that have been uh, significant if you're reading your Old Testament? Like Isaiah or Micah. They, they say the same thing, but if you're reading the Old Law, where had the law gone out from? The first law, their law, Mount Sinai. Right? They're, they're reading from the law of Moses, which went forth from a mountain, and it certainly wasn't Zion. Right? It was Sinai. And so it's prophesying a new law that would go forth, uh, a law that would go forth from Jerusalem. And so that's why you see Jesus very specific. You need to stay in Jerusalem. Uh, this is one of those prophecies that he's making sure is fulfilled, right? because that's how he wants the gospel to spread, starting from Jerusalem. Uh, it, it also suggests that this law would not just be for Israel, right? What does it say in the prophecy? Yeah, all nations would, be, would flow to it. You also saw that in Luke 24, all nations. So they shouldn't have been surprised when Cornelius was welcomed in and others, uh, and it goes into all the earth. Okay? Uh, so we're, we're seeing now the fulfillment of these great prophecies. What did Jesus mean when he said, you shall be my witnesses? Eyewitnesses, right? Yeah, we talked about even John saying a hand witness, right? I touched uh, his, his wounds. I know that he was real. Um, so this is, a, this is a small point of clarification, I think, that we need sometimes. Because do you hear people saying that they would like to witness to you? Or that they gave their witness or their testimony how is that different if a person today gives their testimony? What are they generally talking about when they say they want to give their testimony? How they came to Jesus, right? Something that happened to them. How does that compare to what these men were witnessing to? <laughs> uh, Phyllis? Three years of their life with Christ. Nobody today has spent any time with Christ. <laughs> right. and, and I'm sorry, but your personal experience doesn't mean much to me. It does, it's not the basis for my faith. Uh, it's, our faith is built on these uh, infallible proofs, right, that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, and therefore I should believe in him so that I can have that same hope of resurrection. So you may have an interesting story about how you came to Christ. I love hearing those stories about how a person comes to Christ. A lot of times people uh, feel like they need something miraculous in that story and maybe think they experienced something miraculous. Well, I'm sorry, but I can't put a lot of faith in that either. Uh, for one, I read my New Testament and see that those things would be done away with, and so I don't really know that those things are happening. Uh, but two, it's just your word that you had this experience, you know, had a great come to Jesus moment. I'm sorry, but that witness doesn't mean much to me to build my faith. So we, we, sh we could pitch that language altogether, I think, because the apostles were witnesses. What were you a witness to compared to what Peter and John were witness to? It's their witness that we base our faith upon, what they saw. So I think that's an important clarification. Norm? Yeah. It was not a generalized, y'all are going to be all my witnesses. It was you, those 11, are going to be my witnesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And later on, he tells Paul the same thing. I'm going to send you, you're going to be my witnesses. That's right. And it was the specific people that was given to you. It wasn't given to everybody. And, and I don't want to discourage anybody from sharing their faith, right? Because we are supposed to be evangelistic. But our evangelism is not about what, what happened to me. 
uh, or some special event in my life. It's a special event here in the life of Jesus, that he rose from the dead and that people saw him. That's what we should be sharing. All right, well, we, we're going to skip reading uh, the, the next part of the text, but the story of the ascension comes next. Of course, he's lifted up out of their sight, verse 9, and a cloud receives him out of their sight. Uh, and then two men appear, like they so often do. And they talk to them, verse 11, saying, Why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Why is that still important for us today? That's right. We're still waiting for the fulfillment of this prophecy, right? Not many prophecies in the scriptures uh, are not yet fulfilled, but this is one of them. We're waiting for the return of Christ. So, figuratively, we may find ourselves looking into the sky, right? Just waiting for his return. But what should we be doing? Making yourself ready. Norm? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, they, they were uh, looking forward to Jesus' return and then not being busy, right? There's work to be done. I referenced John 9, 4. Uh, we must work the work of him while it is day, for night cometh when no man can work, right? There's a time, there's an end coming where work will be done. This is the time for work. And so you see the apostles get to work, right? Their, their mindset changes. They gather together. They're obeying Jesus, staying in the city, but they get to work. And they work on fulfilling or filling this empty seat in the 12 apostles. Norm? Like literally told them just before this happened, go to Jerusalem and wait. They're just standing there. <laughs> but he's already gone. They're just standing there. That's right. Very, it's kind of a microcosm of what happened. He told them to work. I mean, he told them to go forth from Jerusalem. And what the Christians do, they stay there. It's like a few angels that show up and say, hey, why are you doing this? <laughs> Yeah, this is a view of the, the Mount of Olives where they were, also referred to as Bethany, which was near the Mount of Olives, where Jesus ascends. Um, I, I wish we had time to look at some of these pictures. There's a 2,000-year-old olive tree on the Mount of Olives, but you're not going to find olive groves up there anymore. What you find is this. This is a picture of the Mount, uh, and it's completely covered, uh, as you can see, by stone structures. There's not any trees left, not many. Uh, and what those stone structures are, are these tombs, sepulchers, where people want to be buried on this mountain. Why do you think that is? They're taking this prophecy very literally, right? Uh, he's going to return in the same way in which he left, and if it's on this mountain, they want to be right there. Is there any reason to worry that we're half a world away and we might not see them? No. no. It's going to be something that we all see and hear and experience. But I thought that was interesting. All right, we're out of time. Uh, so maybe Jesse can throw in a little on the choosing of Matthias next week.